everyone. Welcome. It's so great to have you here. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. My name is Amber Pichet, and I look after the marketing here at Faroque System. Today, we are joined by Chef Angus Ann and Todd Shu. Todd is one of the earliest pioneers of Citrix Solutions in North America, who built one of the most successful Citrix practices in the world. His business was acquired by Citrix in 2012, after which Todd led Citrix's consulting organization in Canada for five years. Todd joins Faroque as both president and partner. Chef Angus Ann is one of Vancouver's most influential chef restaurateurs with a slate of seven restaurants and eateries in his restaurant family. Fat Mound Noodles, which I had the privilege of eating at yesterday, Freebird Chicken Shack, Longtail Kitchen, Maynam, Papina Canteen, Papina Cantina, and Sen Pad Thai. Chef Angus's flagship restaurant, Maynam, has received many local and international accolades, among them 2016 Restaurant of the Year from Vancouver Magazine and 2018's Top 25 Restaurants in Canada, as well as being named one of Zagat's Top 200 Restaurants in the world. Chef Angus has also been honored with two prestigious invitations to showcase his cooking at world-renowned James Beard House. In May 2020, Chef Angus published his first cookbook, Maynam, A Fresh Approach to Thai Cooking. A flavor-driven chef, Angus creates dishes that are rooted in impeccable technique. His combined fine arts and French culinary tasting training give him a unique perspective on cooking as a balance of art and science resulting in recipes that seamlessly blend tradition, innovation, and presentation. Today, Chef Anne will be walking us through how to make two Thai dishes, Gaiyan and Nam Duck. Uh, first one is a Northern style grilled hen, and the second one is a grilled beef salad. Todd, I'll pass it over to you to tell everybody a little bit about Faroque System. Yeah, well, welcome everybody. Uh, first of all, Happy uh, Year Tiger! Happy Year, Happy Year Tiger! You can see that that uh, brought the uh, brought the Tiger <laughs> shirt here. You know, uh, I was born in the Year Tiger, so this is very exciting to me. Um, you know, so thanks for everybody tuning in today. Um, a little bit about uh, about us, about Faro Systems. For those of you who have actually been um, following us in the last couple of years, you understand that we we've been doing a lot of these uh, these uh, uh, events, and uh, you know both. Uh, both technical and uh, and some are uh, some are leadership uh, and business uh, oriented. Uh, you know, talked with uh, with different type of uh, um, you know business leaders uh, and uh, and you know and 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 people that we actually find uh, find similarity with. And uh, today, actually, we we um, we like to actually start. We kicked off 2022 with a new value about us because everybody knows for our systems is. Um, an IT services company, a consulting firm, a managed services company. We specialize in uh, digital workspaces, which is you know a lot of what we do right now: with remote work, remote uh, uh, remote application delivery, remote uh, um, uh, remote workspaces. But uh, what we are doing is also launching some of our new uh, and redefine our value uh, of the company. So um, our our new company value, or what we kind of re reassess ourselves, and we define those four four main things about us. Really, one is passion. Uh, the second is humility. The third is purpose, and the last one is accountability. Uh, that's really what we believe. What you know, what is us for our systems? Right, passion of what we do is what drives us to learning and mastering uh, what we you know what we what we wanted to do. Uh, in in our in our day to day in our clients, and the humility is that you know the humbleness that we want to to be able to continue to learn and continue to get better, uh, and you know and then it's the uh, I'm always a big fan of design thinking, um, you know doing things for purpose. It's not just for cosmetic. It doesn't we don't do stuff just because it looks good. It has to be have a purpose. It has to have um, it has to have uh, a long term thinking. A long you know so. Uh, so what we design for you uh, should work today, and it should prepare you for tomorrow, right? Uh, and then of course that the, the accountability part is that every one of us are very accountable in terms of what we do, what we, um, what we serve to our client, you know, the responsibility that we have uh, to our customers, our community, 
uh, in our industry as a whole. So that's uh, that's what that's who we are, really, right? And uh, and we we like to actually use today's opportunity to kind of kind of you know resonate with what our friend is doing. Uh, and, uh, and and you see that uh, you see that uh, that there's I think there's a lot more similarities in terms of delivering deliver that that great customer experience, right? The user experience that uh, that we do. So that's that's uh, that's that's what's about us. And Ember, I think we can uh, we can move on to the next uh, next slide. Uh, today the uh, the session is sponsored by our good friend and my uh, my long time uh, my 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 long time uh, I want to say my IT relationship uh, company uh, Citrix Systems. Uh, I have a 25 year love relationship with the company uh, by having a long uh, long long-running partnership with the company. I even sold the business to them. I work there, I have a long long relationship with them. Um, I know that uh, those of you who follow the industry, Citrix Systems has been in the news quite a bit lately, uh, but uh, I think it's all for the good, uh, all for the, uh, all, again, it's, it's a time to actually, for a company to redefine itself and, uh, and also, uh, also uh, reassess and then you know restart in terms of getting into the uh, really really find itself in the cloud right so uh, so I uh, you know thank you uh, to Citrix Systems for uh, for helping us um, uh, sponsoring this uh, this event and uh, and of course that uh, we all know that Citrix Systems um, has one of the best suites of you know technology that does application delivery and provides you with that virtual workspace. Um, and you know, just like a great chef, right? When we, as a consulting company, we try to put a solution together for a client, it's like you putting a dish together with the best ingredients, and mm -hmm. with, yeah, and 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 there are certainly Citrix Systems certainly has the best ingredients for for us to build that solution for you, and uh, and for for those of you who are listening, uh, they definitely have. You, you probably already have that in your environment. You probably already using some of the technologies and uh, and. Um, you know, certainly that uh, that you have made a good choice, and uh, and continue. We're going to continue to actually do fun things and do great things, and uh, and be more creative in terms of our in terms of our digital uh, our digital work life, right? So uh, so again, they invented the word anyness. Uh, so any device, anywhere, anytime. Uh, those of you who follow us, uh, I tend to like to actually work in a Lamborghini. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, and and and, uh, and actually work from anywhere, and uh, you know, and, and today is no no different, right? We're we're on site, we're on site at uh, at my friend uh, Angus's house in uh, Vancouver. That's very very exciting. So, Amber, back to you. Let's talk about what we're gonna talk. What 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 do we have, and then uh, we can uh, get the show on the road. Awesome. Well, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to make two dishes today, Guy Young and as well Nam Duck. So let's hand it over to Chef Ann, and uh, I will catch up with you guys later. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Amber. Hey, cheers. 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 Yeah, welcome, uh, welcome to Vancouver. Welcome to my house, Todd. Uh, yeah. It's been a long time. Uh, for those of you guys that obviously don't know our past, uh, I know Todd for probably 20 years. Yeah. We met in Montreal, and we're both cutting our teeth in our respective industries. Uh, I was cooking and, uh, you know, he had to start his own business. And uh, we both obviously at that time had a passion for food and wine. And uh, when he asked me to do something like this for him, I said, yeah, you know, let's do it. Come over to my house. So we'll have a glass of wine. Let's cook together. So welcome, everyone. Uh, for those of you guys that who have never been to Vancouver, uh, I'm Angus. I'm a main on restaurant uh, among some other smaller restaurants. But we also have a cookbook, Main on a fresh approach to Thai cooking, which you guys will be getting a copy of. And thanks for joining. And I'm, I'm hoping that everyone's had a really good uh, Lunar New Year, uh, regular New Year, as well as hoping everyone stays safe during uh, this kind of COVID times. And I'm hoping we're over the worst of it. But for me, uh, I think one thing that's always brought me, sort of uplifted me during this tough time is food. Good food, good friends, good wine. Uh, I think it's the key to, to, to be able to get through any kind of tough times. I have two really fun dishes for you today. Uh, the reason why I picked these two dishes mm -hmm. are twofold. A, I had just came back from Thailand and I was in Chiang Mai. So these two dishes are quite common in that area. These two dishes are more common in the Isan region, Northeast, North, Northern Thai. And it's also second reason 
is that it's really, really simple. I love to cook outdoors, charcoal grill, fire, I mean, wood fire cooking. Uh, you know, I like to think winter is almost over, so I'm getting you guys ready for springtime grilling. Uh, so that's one of the main reasons I really want to showcase these two recipes. And, and they're really, you know, the book is really easy to follow. And this, these two recipes are one of the simplest and the most delicious as well. Uh, so to start, I'll give a little quick talk about our chicken. So here I have a chicken. This is actually called a Long King chicken. It's actually a Taiwanese hybrid, uh, right. like, like us. Yes. Um, this is actually a crossbred between the traditional yellow skin chicken uh, and sort of a Western uh, fryer chicken, as you may. So you get the flavor. You can see the skin is a lot yellower. Mm -hmm. You get the flavor. Um, you'll, but yes, you also get still the, the delicate texture. Uh, so this is the chicken I prefer. What I have actually done here, uh, as per our tradition at the restaurant, is we actually hang it air dry in the fridge. Uh, if we, obviously, if you don't have a walk-in fridge at home, I would put this on a wire rack and then just uh, so that the air can circulate and let it dry in the fridge for at least two to three hours, preferably overnight. Now, if you just open up the chicken out of the, the cryo bag, it's often very wet and that's sort of not, that's the last thing you want to throw on the grill is a wet chicken. So you want to dry that off, uh, even if it means just tiling it off, okay? Uh, so what we're going to do is traditionally we would grill this 100% on the grill. Now it is a little raining outside uh, for the ease of this demonstration. Uh, I'm going to butterfly it or spatchcock it and we're going to par roast it in my oven here and then we're going to finish it outside on the grill all in one shot with the beef. So to do that, uh, obviously you want to grab a chicken. Yeah. Thank you. You want to grab your thickest knife, okay? Now this is my heavy duty chef knife and you want to go on the back. What I've also done is you notice uh, when you get the wings like this, I always like to sort of tuck them in so now they're nice and tucked in and then they'll grill nice. So that's trick number one. If I was roasting this whole, a second trick I do is I can pierce the skin here. You'll make an incision right behind the thigh, just the skin. And what I'll do is I'll actually tuck the bone in right here. Okay, so it's almost like thrusting the chicken, but my trick is without the string. So you do that on both sides. You don't have to, but it just sort of makes a better presentation Roll slightly easier. You want to be gentle because you don't want to rip that skin as well. So now it's nice and tough. Okay. We're going to go on the back, find the spine with your heavy knife and just go down the middle. Okay. You want to grab a nice heavy knife so it makes the job easier. Now, as I break that open, the breastbone and the breastplate there, give it a little it's in there and there now it's nice and flat now okay ready for the grill like that so the reason for that is when you hit the grill it's an even piece an even piece will allow it to cook evenly and that's exactly what we're looking for so now i'm going to throw this onto a baking pan inside up now again i'm doing this in my oven mostly for demonstration purposes if you were to do this on the grill from the beginning, I would start with the skin side up, just so it gets a bit of coloration first. And then once the chicken is 80% cooked, we'll go skin side down to get a nice coloration on the skin. So I'm gonna quickly wash my hands. And my oven is set at 325 degrees. And just a just, uh, regular uh, convention oven, you don't need the fan for this one, okay? Give it a quick clean, because we're dealing with chicken. We're gonna make a marinade, and on the recipe, if you're doing this on the grill, you can pre-marinate this, but right now we're part roasting it. We're gonna get the marinade ready, and we're gonna brush it just before it hits the grill. That way my skin right now is dry, so it gets nice and crispy. And we'll get the marinade on there quickly and then just to finish it off on the grill. So in here, I have coconut cream. It's gonna put, this dish is done probably a million different ways in Thailand. Now, some people roast it just like that with salt and pepper. Some people would do coconut cream only. Some people would do garlic. Some people put a lot of sugar. Uh, it's really, really up to you. I find that, um, if you have a really good chicken, you don't need to do that many different options. 
on the recipe it says uh, dark soy sauce, and that's totally optional because uh, it gives you that little uh, sure. better caramelization. Yeah. But uh, I prefer to leave it out because I like to actually get uh, a, a nice light golden color, mm -hmm. a little bit of sugar, not too much, a little bit of pump sugar. Uh, so I why, like to use why palm sugar and sugar just for flavor. Uh, palm, palm sugar gets better color, uh, and then sugar just gets a little bit of sweetness, but I don't want to add too much of both. So, uh, I have uh, two different pepper mills. Uh, white one is for white pepper. So, for chicken, I like to use white pepper just so that it doesn't get too much specks on them. I'm going to use fish sauce. The easiest way to do this, uh, I like to do maybe just a easy hand blender, which now once it's done, the cream itself will act as a bit of an oil. So when you brush it on and grill the skin side down, it kind of will protect the skin as well. Okay. Oh, because we're doing this in the oven first, I didn't want to put the marinade on and get too much color before we hit the grill. Right. A little bit more fish sauce. That's it, we're gonna leave that aside. I have a little brush here that we're gonna keep here. Uh, get ready for the chicken when it comes out. Now, another thing that we're gonna make next is the dipping sauce for the chicken. Mm -hmm. This recipe is called namjin jiao. Namjin actually just means sauce or dip, right? Mm -hmm. uh, namjin jiao and this particular one is always served with grilled meat. It's very common in the Northern part of Thailand. And you always have tamarind. So this is tamarind water. We take tamarind pulp, we soak it in water overnight, and we pack it. So that's what you get. You can actually find ready pass tamarind water uh, in grocery stores yeah, yeah. or specialty grocery stores. Okay. Yeah. Uh, key ingredient is the rice. Uh, it's a it's a long step process, but I sort of separated here for you. Okay. So you see, sticky rice. Uh, Asians we, we love sticky rice because it's the glutinous rice. Okay. Yes. Uh, this is regular uh, high sticky rice that you'll find. Mm -hmm. What you want to do is soak that in water overnight so the, the, the starches get plumbed with water. Well, I don't think you can actually cook it without soaking it. Yeah, you don't want to cook it anyway. Yeah. So you soak it like this and then that becomes uh, ready to go. And then what you want to do is you want to dehydrate it. You don't want to cook it. Okay. You want to just basically put it in a pilot oven or spread it out, dehydrate it until it's almost dry like this again. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, you want to toast it in a wok or in the oven mm -hmm. until it's golden brown. Okay, so smell the difference. It's got a very nutty smell, very yeah. aromatic. So that's what you want. And that's one of the secrets to both of these recipes today. Okay, so I'm going to start and I'm going to show Ta how to do this. Okay. So what we're going to do is in my mortar and pestle, we're, we're not going to pound, we're not going to grind. We're, it's a combination of striking on one side of the bowl and coming back okay so i'm pounding and grinding at the same time i'm going to bring it closer to me <laughs> you can really smell the nuttiness it's like close to right yes okay yes you can smell it from here like mm -hmm. you know, where, where i am right now so i'm going in circles as a grinder now okay so Tal, i'll let you continue on with that while okay. i sort of figure out so to to what to what kind of what kind of fineness do i get to? uh you want to get it to almost like a coarse black pepper because okay. it is quite tough on your teeth you don't grind right it enough, absolutely right but we don't want to powder right because right? then it kind of disintegrate uh into all, all of our stuff so you want a nice it, it is also a very nice texture so texturally you want it to be there you want to notice it but you don't want to uh, you don't want to bite into and it. Also, it could actually stick in your teeth too, right? Oh uh, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, really, yeah. So you don't want that. Yeah. So to make the namjim gel, we're gonna add tamarind. It's almost equal parts tamarind, fish sauce, and, and lime juice. 
And when I use lime juice, it's always freshly squeezed. Uh, we go through about four cases of limes a week at the restaurant. Uh, we don't buy pre-squeezed uh, just because lime juice oxidizes really quickly. And definitely none of that plastic bottle stuff from, uh, from Safeway, okay? <laughs> no. So that's my trick to kind of just get the, the cheeks. I call it lime cheeks, no, no seats. I'm going to juice that in here. Stir it up. I mean, there's also something about the freshness of freshly squeezed limes that you can replace with uh, anything else. That's looking pretty good. Do you want to show the camera uh, how far you've gone? And then uh, I think just a little bit more. Right yeah. There. So we're, let me see, we're at this stage and uh, okay. a little more. So now we're ready to add fish sauce. And in this recipe, this is what I call blue tongue powder or blue tongue chili powder. Uh, when you read the recipe, it's actually dry bird's eye chilies. Um, you can buy them from a any Asian supermarket. Yeah. And you toast them whole in the wok until they kind of smell like burnt coffee. Mm -hmm. And you can smell, don't get too close, but smell it. It's got a real nice toasty flavor. Yes. You know, like the other day we're talking about the smell of the chili. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's what you're looking for in this case. Okay. Yeah. So we want to. Use your discretion, spicy. So, you know, use as much or as little as you, you, you like. It is meant to be a bit of a, a spicy dip. So I like to add a bit, about a, a teaspoon and a half, okay? And in this case here, we're gonna add some fresh shallots. We're just gonna slice it thin. Okay, we're gonna add that in there. Good. That's, that's good, perfect. I'm gonna take a spoonful of this into my sauce. You don't wanna do it too early because uh, then the, the rice will thicken up, okay? Uh, you you wanna do it sort of uh, within about half an hour of you wanting to serve this. So you can see that kind of grittiness and you can smell the, the toasty nuttiness. Of I always thought that, you know what that sauce, I always thought it was peanuts. No, oh, it's, I know. It's, yeah. yeah, wow. Uh, and it's really easy to make. Now, optional is I like to add a little bit of, um, Lemongrass powder. Lemongrass powder we make ourselves. It smells like a tight spot, mm -hmm. right? It's yeah. actually just with dehydrated lemongrass that we do ourselves and we grind it. Uh, so I'm going to do that. Do a little bit in here, and then I also have a bit of galango powder. So this is dry dehydrated galango. Uh, make it into a powder. Now this powder is ready to go, and we put that on a lot of sauces. And that powder also is a garnish for our salad. So this. It's almost there. We're going to add a spoon of sugar. We're going to let it sit. It needs to sit a little bit to develop uh, the flavor. Uh, we're going to work on sort of our knife cuts of the things that we need for our salad. Uh, grab your favorite salad bowl. This is my favorite salad bowl. Uh, we're going to work on a bit of our knife. Tell people about the, uh, the salad bowl. Uh, this is from a local uh, wood turning artist. So I've been sort of eyeing his uh, pieces for a while. So this is actually a a local spalted maple, uh, mm -hmm. hand turned, and we, we we eat a lot of salad at home. So I've always liked you. I've always lusted for a really beautifully hand turned salad bowl. So I, I finally uh, bit the bullet and bought one from uh, from this uh, artist that's locally here. So very I'm nice. really happy with the purchase. Uh, I thought it was really impressive. <laughs> I'm like, wow, this is actually one piece, one piece of wood. Now for for the salad, um, it's a really really simple salad. So Thai salads are very different than Western salads. You know, it, 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 for us, we think salad is like oh, lettuce and dressing, mm -hmm. right? For Thai salad, it's often meat focused, meat heavy, or whatever the protein is. And then there's almost never lettuce, right? It's not part of their diet. Right. It's a lot right. of herbs, okay? okay? Yeah. So in this salad, there's freshly picked coriander or cilantro, depending on you know where you're from. Yeah. Freshly picked mint. Now I said freshly picked, so you don't take a bunch of cilantro and just start chopping it, okay? What you need to do is obviously clean it like we have here and just pick off the leaves. That's what we have done here. And then we save the stem for other purposes. So if you have the recipe, we, we, we make the stems into dressing. Uh, you know, at home, when I'm not making Thai food, I, I keep the stems 
I slice it really fine for like a salsa verde, a mm -hmm. salad dressing, you know, it's a lot of aroma, but uh, for the salad, we just want to pick the, pick the leaf and that's all you want to be doing. Don't, don't chop it. Okay. Or don't let me know that you chop it. So now we have the two equal parts. We're going to do cilantro, mint. Okay. Now the cilantro and mint combined, it's actually quite soothing and cool because this, the salad is actually quite spicy. Okay, so we're gonna find some nice smaller shallots. We're gonna cut really thin. Uh, use use small young shallots, not not red onions, because they're a lot sweeter. Okay. Uh, this is a smaller one. Now, how could you tell if that is a young one? Um, I mean, some of them are overly big and we don't, we don't actually even buy those. So they're just, mm -hmm. they're just smaller and younger and, yeah. you know, as you're slicing through it, it's made more tender. And, uh, also from, from experience, we know this, this, uh, these shallots that we buy from Washington are, are very sweet, not, not pungent. Right. So, yeah. um, a lot of the ones from China are, mm -hmm. are, are quite pungent. So, right. so that's pretty much all we need. So about a shallot and a half, uh, I think that's probably a bit too much there. Okay. Now this is uh, soft tooth coriander. So in, I think you guys probably have some American uh, um, viewers. So this down south, uh, they call it culantro. So you can find it in a lot of Latin stores. Yeah. So basically it's called, also called soft tooth coriander. You can see sort of a saw like blade on, a, on, the, on these yes. leaves, okay? Yes. It's very fragrant. Mm -hmm. Smells like cilantro, but more uh, herbaceous, more woody, yeah. more earthy. So I the fact that uh, if you go and have uh, pho, mm -hmm. in, uh, yeah, in, they use this a lot. Yeah. In the U.S., especially in the U.S., they use this a lot. Yes, yes. Not, as, not as much in Canada, but in the U.S., the sure. Vietnamese yeah. shots, they, they, they will have that a lot. Yeah. So we're also going to add a little bit of this into our dressing. Okay. So now, when you're cutting things at home. Um, you know, you you want to make sure, a if you're not experienced uh, with your knife, don't don't get a big ginormous bunch and trying to cut, uh, you know, awkwardly, right? Uh, comfort is always the most important thing. So get yourself a manageable bunch, and what I always do is get a nice and tight package here, right? And then you want to you want to rock with your knife, and you, you know you don't want to this you don't need to slice paper thin. Oh, you see how effortless that knife is just going through? You're gonna have a good knife too. Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, professionally, you know, you. Well, I think that a lot of people actually don't know how to use the proper side of the knife. Yeah, so these yeah. knives are, you know, these are typical um, Western French style knives, okay? Yeah. Uh, they're also called chef knife. Mm -hmm. uh, they are designed with a curve. Now, the curve doesn't mean you just go up and down. We call it a rock. So it's a slicing motion. Right. You never want to crush anything you cut. You want to slice through it. So when you also can hear, maybe you thought you can put your microphone to it. It's not crushing sound. It's a slicing sound. Yeah. Okay. It's a very aromatic uh, herb. Okay. And we're going to just quickly cut this up. It's optional to also add a little bit of lemongrass. So we'll do that because I have some here. We have beautiful Thai lemongrass that um, we import ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to be grilling steak later because I, actually a funny story. One of the first times that I met Todd in Montreal 20 years ago, I drove up from, from New York to visit a, a mutual friend of ours. And uh, one of the first things that I had to do for them was uh, they're like, oh, you got you to gotta, you gotta cook us a steak. Of course. <laughs> well, you got, a, you got a room full of, uh, full of young boys. Yeah. Right? I remember that day. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna put that in my salad. I'm gonna put a little bit of this into our uh, dressing as well. So it's just cut up a little bit more. Now our our chicken in the oven, depending on how thick it is, my I know my chickens because um, I call them 35 minute chickens. I mean, it takes 35 minutes. So you know, we'll take them out in about 35 minutes, which is probably in about another 15 minutes. So at about Local time 145, we'll head out to the grill and finish it off. Sure. Perfect. So while you're slicing, you want to 
you wanted to tell tell everybody about the about how your your well first of all we can talk about how we can talk about how we met but before we talk about that you can talk about uh, you know how you how you come from like from middle of uh, Vancouver to uh, to all over the world ah uh, so you know like Todd, I was born in Taiwan. We, we, my family immigrated here uh, to Vancouver uh, at a very young age for me. Uh, growing up here, I've always had kind of a fondness for food, but for arts as well. Uh, so I went to school for fine arts and I wanted to be an architect. Uh, but every single job I ever had growing up um, had been in a restaurant. Uh, even when I was going to university uh, for fine arts and for architecture, um, you know, I had a, I had a, I had a job cooking. Mm -hmm. So was very important to me. Uh, my parents were very good. Um, you can see it's all, you can see it's thickened up a bit. Okay, from the uh, from the rice from the rice powder. Yeah. So that's 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 good. We leave that there. Uh, food was really important to me. Um, I've always wanted to to learn how to cook better. So in university, I eventually gave up. Uh, I finished my degree, but I said, you know what, I I want to go into cooking. Mm -hmm. So I I moved to New York at the time. Started uh, French uh, Culinary Institute. Uh, I, I finished my uh, my cooking training there. I moved to Montreal, yeah. uh, where we met. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked in Montreal for three years, and then I decided to travel to Europe. And I cooked uh, uh, Thai food for me. Actually, came uh, accidentally. I, I I met a really great chef named David Thompson. Uh, at the time, he was the only Michelin star Thai chef. So I I learned Thai in food London. in London. In London, in London, yeah. At that time, I learned Thai food with him, and ultimately that saved my career because when we moved back to Vancouver in '06. I opened a European restaurant called Gastropod. Why Linen? Uh, I don't think it was fine dining. I think the local style was fine dining. When the recession came in 08, 09, mm -hmm. you know, we were losing $25,000 a month. And it was very hard for a, a young businessman who had just started off. And, you know, I was really scared and nervous. And we thought, hey, why don't we just uh, turn this restaurant into a casual Thai restaurant? Mm -hmm. uh, at, at that time, there's no good Thai restaurant in Vancouver. So why don't we? you know, use what we learned from David uh, and cook some beautiful Thai food. My wife's Thai, so, you know, we know we can do, a, you know, better. Mm -hmm. So we did that and, and we never looked back. That saved my career. And and now we are looked to as sort of one of the finest Thai restaurants in the country. We were invited by the Thai ambassador to his house in Ottawa this year yeah. to celebrate yeah, yeah. Uh, 60th anniversary of Thai and Canadian foreign relations. So, you know, I think having learned Thai food, and it's something I would tell young chefs as well, you know, I've never never have tunnel vision when you're learning things. You know, it's like you're going to French school, you, you want to be French chef because it looks fancy on TV, but uh, not everyone makes it. You have to be able to diversify and, and cook food that people want to eat. Cook food that, you know, you can have every day. One of the reasons that we closed Gastropod was people always say, hey, Gastropod, I heard that restaurant. It's got great reputation. I, I'm, I'm going to... I'm going to come on my birthday or anniversary. Like, no, no, it's, it's an everyday restaurant. You can come anytime you want, you know? Yeah. But now with Mainom, uh, we have customers that come like once or twice a week. Right. You know, we have, uh, since we started a new reservation system, we have reservations from guests that have like been to the restaurant 300 times. Oh, wow. So those are, those are for me, how we can be successful. It's like we offer something that's different, yeah. uh, something that they can have every day. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm really glad that uh, my path took me on this tangent to learn Thai food, right? So yeah, and and you know, and then again, that I think that goes back to what we talked about, what we just brushed on earlier, like the, the great user experience, right? Mm -hmm. like you gotta you gotta deliver something that is uh, that you know that that your customer, your users will feel that they they you know they get a lot of value out of it and and, uh, and very uh, very happy about it when they walk away. So. Yeah, so at, at Perot Systems, right, we talked about our new corporate value, which is, you know, about passion, uh, humility, uh, the uh, uh, purpose, and, uh, and and also the accountabilities, that, you know, right? The reason I said that earlier that uh, that I see a lot of similarities, because mm -hmm. we, we chat, you know, we chat on and off, and we chat, uh, we talked uh, last night uh, as well, it's, you know, we, there's a lot of similarities in terms of, what we do in IT, trying to put a lot of like you see so many ingredients together uh, to make it into uh, to make it into a great dish. But more importantly, is that is is also how to actually turn it into a great business, right? So um, you know we talk about a lot of similarity in it, and in, in, like in your words, like what what are those what are those uh, those values meant to you and meant to your business? 
Well, I think, you know, passion for first and foremost, right? Like you have to have passion to like what you do, uh, but, but you can also let that take away too much. And I think one of the key reasons I failed first with gastropod is I think it felt more like a passion project to me, right? So, um, you know, it, if you do everything with passion, but no, no, no business sense, then it's hard to succeed as well. And I think I learned from that and I kind of stepped away from that, uh, you know, I think I, I'm obviously still very passionate about cooking. Uh, so to answer your question, I think passion for me has to be the feel that, that drives you, but then you have to have business sense and all the other aspects right. to, to guide you. So, you know, I think some, sometimes people, you know, a lot of chefs are like artists, you know, I see a lot of young chefs are like, oh, you know, you just eat whatever I cook, you know, no. <laughs> Uh, I always say this because uh, uh, for me, I, I'm still, you know, really a fan of arts and architecture and the great architect Frank Geary said, you know, for him, you know, one of the world's most renowned architects, between building cults, between site demands, between clients, between city, in his opinion, there's only 15% of true creativity left in the project. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wow, a, a modern day master, like a true master of his craft said there's only 15% for his creativity. Who are you to say that, oh, you know, I'm going to cook everything like what I want and you have to eat it. No, because you have to cook things that people want to eat. You know, for me, my passion wants me to make this, but then if people don't order it, my business sense should tell me, hey, you got to alter the recipe. You right. know what I mean? So I think that's the balance. Uh, quickly, uh, here's lemongrass. It's the young lemongrass. Uh, I like lemongrass, but you have to slice it really, really fine if you're eating it in a salad application. So mm -hmm. you just want to slice it fine because it is a very tough, Fibrous, yeah. Fibrous uh, piece, and if you look at it, like I see that you also took out the, the outside, yeah, right before you chop it. So, uh, so you want to slice it almost paper thin in this case, okay? And to do that, Todd, it's like a lot of times you're taught to curl your fingers, mm -hmm. and no, notice how much room you have wiggling your, your knife. Yeah. Now, I, I, in this application only, I tell people to just have your knife right up against your fingernails. Right. Now, if you never slice, if you never raise your knife up high. Right. You will never cut your fingernails. So I'm only just raising the knife enough to slice through it. So that's how I control it. Okay, so you can see. Yeah. It's just paper thin. Yeah. So continue. <laughs> no, no, no. I was just I was saying that uh, it, it's it is a very uh, it's very fragrant, but it's very very tough if you if you do it not proper. Mm -hmm. uh, just put it that way. Right. So. One of the things I teach people about cook, cooking, uh, Thai cooking, like the way our, our moms cook, is very intuitive. You know, like they, they taste, they taste, they taste, they feel. Uh, a lot of our recipes, these these are the simplest recipes in our restaurant. A lot of them have like 30 ingredients. And if you're trying to uh, see a young cook memorize everything, then forget about it. For me, I tell them to to look at it, to smell it, to 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 toss it. When you're tossing it, listen to it. Like what's missing, right? Right now. Just, just talking, I know I'm missing something, which is this, mm -hmm. and I can smell it, right? So it's yeah. the powder. So always use your senses. Don't, don't force things, but trust you. Uh, cooking intuitively is one of the key things about, you know, Thai cooking. Right. Okay. So next, we're going to start grilling uh, the beef. But before we do that, I'm going to talk about the beef a little bit. So here I have Brentwood Lake Wagyu which is a local um, breeder. This particular cut is the flank or the bevet. Uh, it's a really uh, relatively inexpensive cut if you're talking about steaks and different things like that. Uh, the reason I like it is because it's still super, super tender and flavorful. Now I have portioned this uh, and you can also see we cleaned it enough that uh, these are all the grains. So these are along the grain. So it's also easier for us to slice afterwards. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You always want to slice uh, perpendicular to where the grain is. So then you have, you break down those fibers. Now fish sauce, we're going to marinate. White pepper. This one, I'm actually going to do a little bit of black pepper too because it's beef. Mm -hmm. Always use uh, freshly ground whole pepper uh, and whole spices. Um, it really makes a huge difference in your cooking. It really, really is. Yes. Okay. So we're going to get this ready. I'm going to check on the chicken and the grill, and we're going to go outside in about two minutes. Okay. 
Okay, so that's almost ready to be outside. Well, have a, have a toast here. Yeah, cheers. By the way, we're drinking uh, we're drinking the 2006 2006 the Padre, uh, yeah. a, a recent discovery of mine. So. Uh, Todd had mentioned 2006 is an important year to him. Well, so are you, because that's <laughs> when you started your own restaurant, right? That's true, yeah. Yeah, yeah so you know, it is Cheers. important to us. Cheers. Cheers. Really, really delicious. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So I'm going I'm to take this out. I'm going to make two trips. So I'll take this out and come back to the chicken. All right. So welcome to my backyard. Uh, I love to cook outside, and this is my uh, green egg. Uh, what we have here, I have preheated already this 350 to 400 degrees. Uh, we're going to brush the marinade on the chicken skin. Now, if you are organizing a party, you can get this done ahead of time in the oven and finish it off on the grill to get the color. Uh, that would be a really good idea, too. Okay. And we're going to carefully pick up the chicken, go skin side. The same time we're going to do the beef as well. All right. Yeah. So while we're yeah, while we're waiting for the uh, for the chicken to be grilled, what are you drinking that for? What do you want? Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Yeah. So. Yeah. So. Uh, so. You know, it's a. It's a. It's a. Uh, the Lunar New Year. Uh, last week. What. Uh, what did you guys uh, do to. Uh, to celebrate? What did you. What did you cook for yourself? Uh, you know, Chinese New Year for me, it's always been one of my. Uh, my favorite food memories growing up. Um, my my parents are really really into food, so it's always one of those things that we we have a huge feast that takes days to prepare. Uh, my family, my grandfather's from Shandong, northeast of China, where dumplings and noodles are are, are really famous for. Mm -hmm. So they spend days making dumplings from scratch, all the skin, all the dough. Uh, so I think Chinese New Year is one of the reasons why I really love cooking because it's always about food and yes. and and making people happy. People well, not not just not just that, right? It's massive amount of food because in our culture, we actually have to have leftovers, right? Like nian uh, yo, right? Yeah. You know, every year you gotta have leftovers. It means that you actually you actually have plenty for the upcoming year. That's kind of the tradition. So, so it's the uh, it's definitely like the I think that the 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 moment every 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 person growing up that that was their their memory about cooking. Oh, for sure. From their family because you you spend days cooking for 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 that one night. And then you have to eat leftovers for the next few days, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, definitely, uh, yeah, definitely, definitely one of those fond memories. So yeah, so we we're, we're talking about like we're talking about passion. We're talking about that uh, these uh, uh, these businesses, and uh, and I think that I think that it's important and it's one of the the, the key values to actually uh, to actually have a passion. For your business, you know, for for you to to do what you do, but um, what's the difference between, you know, between like someone like me who loves to cook, who love love, love the wine, love love all, all, all things uh, food, but like you know, what's the difference between a, a, a home cook and you know a chef and eventually a restaurateur? Well, I think pros. Um, the first thing you learn in cooking school and about cooking efficiently is a smee some plus, which is just things to put in place. It's it's one of the key things to to help you organize. Here I have all the ingredients prepped and organized for me, or else we wouldn't be able to do this so quickly. And I think a lot of the home cooks struggle to, to cook for one table, put out six dishes at a time. We at a restaurant have to put out for 30 tables at a time, at, you know, if they're picked up in multiple multiple courses at a time. So uh, being organized uh, in the kitchen is very important. You have to know mm -hmm. uh, what, are, what are the ingredients that you can prep ahead of time. Yeah. What are, what are the things that you have to cook to order? Right? right. So here, like, I'm not going to make fried shallots when my guests are coming. That that, should, that could be done already. You should know. Uh, I'm not going to do uh, 
dry lemon lemongrass on the day of because it takes two days to dry. So those are the little things that you have to get ahead on and be organized. And and then when you're operating in a restaurant situation, mm -hmm. it, it's one fluid machine. You know, just like yeah, you know, systems. And yeah, in our like business, that. I mean, in our business, exactly. that a lot of people say, well, you know, your network configuration is really one line or ten lines of configurations. It's like it's like applying a script. How can you how can you charge me so much time to do it? And we're like, but but you know, to lead up to that particular configuration, you have to yeah. take in a lot of consideration of, you know, all the circumstances, all the dependables, all the all the intricacies between different systems and configuration, uh, different systems, applications, and things that actually had to had to work together, right? And, exactly. and you need to yeah. orchestrate that in order to, in order to come up with that one, one final script to actually say that okay once you apply this everything will work in synchronous right well, everything will work as it as it should be right and then that that is uh, i think that yeah that is one of the 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 the, the biggest i guess misconception of like people think oh you just sit in front of a keyboard or oh you just cook when, right? when you're good at something you make it look easy and <laughs> um and that doesn't mean it's easy a lot of times when people are like oh you know why do you charge so much money for for, for a dish but they don't understand you know, it's a organic product that we source only for ourselves. They don't understand. Yeah. You know, we're one of the only people that import uh, fresh Thai lemongrass, not not the uh, ones that come from South America. That's mm -hmm. very fibrous and not a lot of flavor. So, you know, you have to appreciate the little details, in my opinion, to really understand. Yes. Uh, we're just making a quick dressing for the nam tok. The salad. Oh, okay. Very very simple. Uh, and difference between a Western dressing and a Thai dressing is there's there's actually no oil. Okay, so. It's, Equal parts lime juice, fresh lime juice, fish sauce. Mm -hmm. We're going to do a pinch of sugar. Okay. Sugar is to balance the heat. Right. Uh, you don't want it too much because then it kills the acidity. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we're going to do the blue tongue. That's probably enough. Okay. So that's that's all there is in the salad dressing. I'm actually going to flip the beef. And then I actually have a beef that's already done cooking and rested. Mm -hmm. You want to cook this to the rare side because when you slice it thin, uh, it loses the, the lime juice. Too, right? Well, yeah, the lime juice is going to cure it too. Right. So I'll be right back. Okay. Cool. All right. So Angus will be right back, and uh, hope you guys are enjoying what we're doing, and uh, and and hopefully, uh, hopefully, able to catch up to every step that uh, that he's doing, because I certainly cannot do what he's doing. And, uh, and yes, you know, there is so many ingredients and so many. Uh, so many things that are already prepped, and I know his staff did a, a, an amazing job uh, preparing it a day before. So, so we're gonna try the salad first. Okay. Um, okay, this is the beef, same cut. You want to slice uh, against that um, fiber, and with any beef, any red meat, any meat in general, mm -hmm. after you grill it, always rest it for at least half the amount of time that you spent on cooking it. Okay. I always do it more because uh, I find that it makes it much more even. And if you need to reheat it, stick it back in the oven. Uh, this is going to be a salad application. So that's a good that point. Needs. That's a that's a good point. So so you let's say you know not this one, but because mm -hmm. uh, it's a salad we can eat it cold. But what if I'm doing a, a, a big ribeye steak okay. and and yes, I, I take it out after let's say I did two minutes high heat both sides and whatever, and it's it's resting and it's the temperature is right, but resting and then cools down again. Cools down again. What what do I do? Okay, so how long do I? You do? want it to cool down, to be honest with you. So what I do when I have a big dinner party in my house mm -hmm. uh, is I will cook the steak before the guests arrive, okay. and I'll rest there for like an hour, and then the only thing is I will not turn off the oven temperature, but the oven will only be about three hundred. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when we're eating, say the the second course or, or, or the starters, I will I will put the steak back in. But as long as I don't imagine there's an internal temperature uh, sort of in the steak that sinks to your brain, as long as you don't exceed the temperature, you cook the steak. Mm -hmm. It won't go any further, right? Oh, I see. So all you need to do is allow the steak internally to pick up the temperature so it's warm. Yeah. So you say it's 160 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. Right? No, no, no. You you should take your steak off the grill if you want medium rare at about. If it's going to be a, a two, and here's another thing, depending on your thickness, those thermometers don't work. Right. Right. Because if you take the steak off at 125, mm -hmm. according to what people say medium rare should be, mm -hmm. yeah. by the time you're actually eating that two inch thick steak, 
there's 140 internal because the carryover is continuous. Right. The thicker it is, the longer the carryover. Oh. So if I want medium rare for my two inch st uh, steak, mm -hmm. I take it off at 95. Oh, I see. And it carries over within the next half an hour. And that's why I leave a very long resting time because that resting time is actually slowly cooking. Mm -hmm. And then I just put it in the oven enough to pick up temperature. Mm -hmm. And I slice it and it's perfectly even pink. Oh. The last thing you want is a high heat and then when you slice into it, it's like gray on the outside and raw on the inside. So right. that, that's my trick for steaks. Oh, so this you want to just slice thin against the fiber, nice and even. Okay. You want it on the rare side because uh, you want to toss with a salad and then the dressing is going to cure it a little bit. Uh, in this case, you want to slice it as thin as you can go. I got my slicing knife here. It's a, a really simple salad. Um, you can you can use uh, pork as well. Mm -hmm. You can also grill duck in this case. Okay, we're gonna toss the meat in here. Okay. It's gonna clean my hand again. The smell is like very, very nutty and rustic. Yes. But yet, I think when you bite into it, there's a, there's a certain balance of refinement. Uh, you can see the steak is grilled quite rare, right? Mm -hmm. But that's by design, especially with flanks because it's so the fiber is so coarse. Uh, it's super tender like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm gonna toss it like that. Now, a lot of Thai salads are very heavily dressed. The reason for that is because Thai people eat everything with rice. Right. So then, you know, that's sort of the nature. Our chicken is almost done. I am going to garnish with a little bit of that. Okay. Maybe we'll bring a close up to the camera. I'll be flipping the beef again. That's the salad. I don't know if you guys can see it, but it certainly looked uh, certainly looked delicious. It looks actually amazing. While I go, you can start tasting. Okay, so right now you can see our steak is coming off. Um, it's nice and rare. And over here, I had just flipped the chicken, so you can see a nice crispy and a nice caramelization. We're gonna let this go a little bit more to get a little bit more color. Five minutes, it'll be ready. It tastes amazing, by the way. Did you try some? Yeah, I just to try, try, I tried a piece. It's, it's amazing. So to get ready for the chicken, mm -hmm. well, I'm gonna serve the chicken in my... We're gonna serve the chicken on the cutting board I made myself, so. <laughs> yeah, so those of you who don't know, Angus is also an amazing carpenter. He did a lot of he did a lot of tables, chairs, furniture, and things in the in the house. Um, so right now, as you can see, the sauce is sticking up quite a bit. That's totally fine. So as we're uh, about to serve, uh, I always like to add a little bit more lime juice and fish sauce. Taste it for seasoning. Always check the balance, okay? Oh, you gotta try the sauce. Yeah. So, new spoon for you. There you go. There you go. Oh, wow. Very rustic, but very, very good. Yeah. Um, you can see why it's really good with uh, quite a bit of heat. heat. Quite a bit of heat. Yeah. Looks at the way I like it. Yeah. Okay. So, I'm gonna put that aside, getting ready. And to garnish, put a little bit of this on top, a little bit of uh, cilantro and fried shallots. There we go. And I'll be back with the chicken. All right.
So as you can see, we're actually doing this. We really are doing this live. And, uh, and you know, like, uh, like Angus said, right? Like, you know, just like what we do in, in you know, in, uh, in rural systems, like everything is about planning and designing and make sure that the make sure things are actually uh, all in place in the so proper way. You can see by butterflying it, you get a nice, you can hear the skin is really crispy. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're uh, going to let it rest for a couple minutes. I'm going to cut into it. White meat does not require as much resting time as red meat, mm -hmm. especially because you're cooking it all the way through. Mm -hmm. It's not a much, um, no guesswork, right? Not as much yes, right? I, I, I let it rest a couple minutes. Mm -hmm. Feel okay? Yeah. And then when you're cutting down the chicken, big knife again, toss on the side. In the meantime, uh, I mean, any other questions that we can get to? Yeah. So, um, so um, let's talk about like how. So, how do you turn your passion into a business? Because being a chef, turning on a good product is one thing, right? And how do you how do you turn that into a business? And now that you have multiple restaurants, like how do you you know in our in in the in the virtual desktop world, the software world, we call it scale. You know, scale up. How do you actually scale up? where you are today? Uh, I mean, I think it's different for everybody. Uh, the example I always give to people is my, my own example. For the longest time, I had just one restaurant. And I was cooking online in a station uh, every day. Because uh, in my mind, I thought we couldn't afford to hire more people. Uh, so we, I had to do a lot of the things myself. But what ended up happening was, you know, my vision of my own company was just that station. Like, I, I'm on chicken station that night. But I really only know how many chickens I sold, how many chicken this. It's very difficult when you're actually immersed in something to fully understand. Uh, and maybe I was young too. So what happened was uh, I got a job offer in New York to consult for a company in New York. Um, at that time, the, the pay was very appealing. So I said, you know what? It, it paid me well enough for me to hire someone else to kind of do my job. I'm going to go and do consulting. I'm going to travel back and forth. But that year, I learned a lot. I learned that if I remove myself from my own business, mm -hmm. I can actually see more things about my own business. Mm -hmm. You know, I gave myself more opportunity to see it from a step back, it's sort of like always looking at the one thing. And I think that year, uh, uh, when the consulting contract was up, I opened my second restaurant. And because being able to travel and do that job, saw my business from far away, gave me the confidence, the ability to do more things, do more businesses, more concepts. And then I think ever for about five, six year stretch there, we're opening one new restaurant every year. Uh, we obviously sort of took a step back the last two years because the uh, pandemic, <laughs> I think everybody's aware. Um, yeah. But right now, you know, we're very fortunate that uh, um, where, we're, where we are at, you know, I think we, uh, we have done quite well and, you know, business has been okay in terms of, uh, pandemic related uh, okay. issues. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, I think for me, you know, the most important thing is really just knowing passion is one thing, but making sure you have the ability to see the whole business, understand it, and don't don't take things uh, personally. You have to analyze things objectively. And that's, I think for me, the most important thing. Yeah. So we're gonna just cut into it. I'm gonna cut this in half first. Okay. You can see how crispy the wings are. So I always like to cut part. Beautiful, okay. I love it just when it's evenly cooked through, okay. A lot of people are worried about the red bones. I know where my chickens are from, and that's probably not an issue, okay. These chickens probably eat better than you and I do. You know, they probably have more room to run than you and I, so it's yeah. not an issue. Yeah. Uh, but do cook your chicken all the way through. When I was in Japan, I had chicken sashimi. I don't know if I told you about that. Yeah, I had that in Japan too. It's, yeah. uh, it's, it's actually but it's only, Yeah, but it's only, I think it's only a certain breed, yeah. right? They don't, they don't, it's not for every, it's not everything that they, they, they eat it raw. It's a certain breed they do. And you have to get top quality chicken, right? Yeah, so absolutely. that's the most important thing. So I always break down the wing and the drum and a bit of the back. And then I take this part here, um, which is the bottom breast, a little bit of the back. And I take the drum and the thigh and cut that in half. And you can you can see how crispy the skin is because a it's got the marinade and b it's, it's also air dry. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Yeah. So well, I like that key, the air dryer was a key, actually. I think that for a lot of people who do who do that at home, they, they really don't take the time to do that. So okay. you can do that at home by, I said, uh, a wire rack and mm -hmm. just place the chicken on top of the rack, salt the chicken inside and out. The salt will also help dry it. Mm -hmm. And just let it sit in the yeah. uh, fridge for that. So then what we're going to do is for, for presentation, always a bit of the same things that is in the recipes. And we serve it with the uh, with the dip. So that's the Gayam recipe. Looks amazing. I'm not, 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 not touching it. I'm not gonna, <laughs> gonna, gonna fall. So <laughs> that's amazing. That is amazing. So just, uh, just you know, out of curiosity, when, when you design dishes, you know, in your time, uh, you've been a chef for a long time. Is there a dish that you thought that is going to work and it didn't? And then is, what is there a, a dish that you thought that it would never work, but it becomes very popular? Oh, all the time. I, 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 it's actually funny how, how little I'm right. Uh, you know, but at the end of the day, like I said, you sort of have to serve what customers want. Yeah. Um, I always tell the story when we first opened Maine on uh, 13 years ago. Uh, my wife's Thai, so she's in the kitchen a lot, uh, sort of telling me what to do, right? And then uh, I made this dish, and I was trying to, you know, in my mind, I was trying to elevate it. I was like trying to dissect it, break it down. Okay, well, we have to sort of puffy rice, so mm -hmm. I was going to dehydrate the rice, repuff it individually like rice krispies, mm -hmm. uh, you know, coat it with curry. She's like, no, in Thailand, I just take cooked rice balls like in a bowl and then just fry the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, that is so amateur. <laughs> so uh, we got into a bit of a scuffle about it. Uh, obviously, she won the fight. Yeah. And then uh, they served it to the customers, and the customers loved it. They're like, oh, it's, it's such a neat idea because when you fry the whole rice ball until it's crispy, the inside is obviously soft. Right. And then what they do is they break it apart, so then you get the contrast of the crispy and the soft. Yeah. And I sort of had to kind of eat the, uh, the, the pail, pie. the humble pie, and, and I was like, yeah, you're right. That dish, that dish has not left the menu. Uh, yeah. And my version would have been way too complicated. Uh, way too costly to make, and mm -hmm. hers is uh, simple and, and, and delicious. So sometimes, uh, yeah. I wouldn't say sometimes, it happens more often than I, I think for me, I learned to listen to others. Yeah. You know, I, my, my head chef, Mike, sorry, my head chef, Mike, has been with us for uh, 12, 13 years. He's, he came shortly after we opened. So, you know, he's been with us for a long time. So he knows my style, he knows my wife's style. Um, so I, you know, I listen to him. I listen to the sous chefs. I listen to my. I listen to, you know, I, I think I have to drop the ego thing. Be like, oh yeah, it's my recipe. You can't change it. No, you know, I think uh, if the customers uh, don't like it. There's a reason, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if I chose to be here, and uh, Vancouver is my market, and I have to cater to that market. So. Right. No, absolutely. You know, it's, it's, it's that. It's the old, you know, the, the the long time debate of like, why do we serve a whole fish with the, the with a head on and you know that will never work in north america right unless you only go to the chinese dish. we serve whole fish uh, a few times actually it's become really popular now i think so two stories yeah uh one story is when we first started serving whole fish i presented the whole fish all proud like look at this whole fish beautiful and then they're like oh can you take it back and debone it <laughs> And I looked at them like, uh, okay, but now now I don't even offer that service. I'm like, just, just eat it as, as is, right? Uh -huh. um, but the, the whole fish for us, you know, I think we, it's been uh, back to what I was saying earlier about Frank Geary saying 15%. In my opinion, I think that's what you start with when we start getting regular customers that mm -hmm. trust you. Mm -hmm. You know, one of our big menu options is sort of like a Japanese omakase, the chef, chef's uh, family style menu. Uh, you, you just let us pick for you. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of our customers, especially regulars, will come in and just say, just cook for us, whatever you want. And I think as you gain their trust, mm -hmm. your 15% increases. Right. And they allow you to do a little bit more because they know uh, and trust you. Right. And, and they, can, they can learn how to appreciate it. Yeah. So, you know, I tell that to a lot of young chefs that come to me for advice on terms of, oh, you know, like opening a new restaurant, like I want to do this menu. It's like, yeah, it's very experimental. Like, I, I, I agree. It's nice. I've seen it in Copenhagen or... New York, and, but this is Vancouver. Mm -hmm. It's a very picky market, and you know, like, are you sure? Uh, you know, no, it's fine. Like, I, I really want to do the food I want. I'm like, okay. You know, you always gotta let them learn through their own mistakes. And for me, um, I I always tell people, there's nothing wrong with making grilled chicken if it's really good. 
Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't need to sous vide it first and then cook it this and that. It, it, it's just making good foods, making simple food is actually more difficult than making complicated. Yeah, the uh, you know, I think years ago, uh, our uh, our friend Citrix actually had a uh, they actually had a, a slogan, and it was simplicity was the highest form of uh, sophistication from our. Uh, uh, then at the time, then uh, the CEO of the company, Mark Templeton, uses he actually lived on that, and and it really is uh, the hardest thing, right? To to really put uh, put something you know so simple yet so effective and so so good um, and make it work. It's uh, it's it takes a lot. It takes a lot more than trying to put together with like sixteen different things. Right? I think I think that the true masters can make simplicity into a masterpiece, and I think. If you think about in terms of relationship with food, uh, two of my favorite cuisines, Italian and Japanese food, mm -hmm. are are simple. You know, I was just in Italy last fall with a great uh, chef friend of mine, Pino, uh, has a great uh, restaurant here in Vancouver, Chipinos, and and you know his sister made me lunch on the first day that I was there. Made me super simple lunch, uh, spaghetti, fresh foraged porcini's, mm -hmm. garlic, olive oil, mm -hmm. a little bit of chili. Oh. <laughs> so good, but everything was cooked perfectly. Right. You know, you go to a really, really good Japanese restaurant and you get uh, a, a properly made nigiri. Yeah. You know, like fish on rice. You watch them work. Like mm -hmm. it's just two ingredients, like fish, rice. Right. But you know, for them growing up as an apprentice, it it probably takes them about five years before the chef will allow them to cook the rice. Right. You know, it's seasoning the rice, cooking the rice is sacred to them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and most of apprentices will spend about five years and then they get to actually make the rice, not the sushi, right. just the rice. Just the rice. And right. you do that and then they allow you to stand next to the, the head chef at the sushi bar, make mm -hmm. a couple of nigiris. Mm -hmm. And it looks simple. I mean, sometimes, you know, I have dinner parties, I try to make it, it's, 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 it's difficult as it felt. Like it's, right. it's to get the simplest things right, mm -hmm. it's an art form. And that's why I think it's, it's better to keep it simple, mm -hmm. but keep it really, really clean and good. Yeah. Than trying to overcomplicate things, and and um, that's one thing I love about Thai food is, uh, I mean, a dish like this might look like a million ingredients, but overall it's very very simple, rustic. It, you know, when you taste it, it's about balance. Uh, majority of Thai people are Buddhist, and mm -hmm. balance is a it's a big thing. You know, when you think about Thai flavors, hot, sour, sweet, salty, mm -hmm. uh, it's about a balance of all four. Sometimes bitter, right? So when you go and eat, like people always love Thai food because it's in an array of those spectrums of flavors. Yeah. Right. So that's what draw me to that cuisine. And when I left Montreal, I left Tokyo. Uh, when I was a saucier there, I made mm -hmm. sauces, which is the most important thing in French kitchens. My seasoning toolkit was salt, pepper. We didn't even use white pepper. We just used black pepper. Really? Salt, pepper. And then when we make gastriques, it's vinegar. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, when I got into a Thai kitchen, like this is my seasoning, you know? I have chili, I have fresh uh, fried shallots as a seasoning. You know, we have lemongrass. We, this is just for today's two dishes. So, you know, I think Asians, especially Thais, they season with flavor, not just like salt and pepper. Right. You know, there might be different layers of salt. You know, maybe, maybe salt cured, like this case, mm -hmm. fish sauce, sometimes soy sauce on top of that. It's about the complex building the layers of flavor mm -hmm. um, that really excited me and, and wanting to learn Thai food. Um, not to say that, oh, uh, I was wrong, French food that I learned was boring. No, I think that French food had a lot of technical terms and te techniques mm -hmm. that you can incorporate. Yeah. And uh, to understand kind of Asian flavor is ultimately uh, what I want you to learn. Yeah, and then that's, that's the thing that I always find that is there's so many, uh, there's so many similarities between your business and mine is that we have to learn, to actually put a lot of these things together into a solution. Uh, you have to understand every single part of the technology. Every, you know, you have to have a classical, well, I wouldn't say classical training, but you have to have a good foundation of how those technologies were and, and you know, what one plus one equals, may not equals to two, may, may equals to three. Um, you know, you have to actually have a lot of really good foundations mm -hmm. uh, in order for you to put something together. And I just, you know, not to say, well, I will slap this on and it will work right away, right? So I, I think that that is, uh, that is why I really appreciate Chef's work. Uh, when it comes to uh, to this, so speaking of like chef work, like you know, I know you do a lot. You know, and, and when you're not eating your own food, what do you eat? Well, you know, I think 
lately I've been obviously cooking at home a lot, but when I'm not cooking, you know, I really crave, I mentioned it already, I really crave Japanese and Italian food. Uh, mm -hmm. For me, I think that if there's two cuisines I can eat all day, every day for the rest of my life, will be probably those two, a combination of. Um, so, you know, here in Vancouver, you know, my favorite restaurants will be probably like uh, Chipino's Italian and, uh, mm -hmm. and Yelltown. Yeah. Uh, Masayoshi would be my friend's really good uh, sushi bar, mm -hmm. and uh, Kista Tanto is another friend of mine, and it's actually Japanese Italian, so two of my favorite yeah. cuisines come yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. I love I love those two cuisines as well. I think it's uh, good to Italy and good to uh, good to we're having Italian wine. Yeah, yeah, we're having yeah. Italian wine here. It's, uh, it's it's absolutely absolutely amazing, and it goes with uh, I'm sure it goes with our food very very well today mm -hmm. as well. And, yeah, so that's uh, that's really, really, really cool. Um, so, okay, so uh, try? yeah, yeah, that's good. I, I can wait. That's, uh, that's, <laughs> that's, 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 let's try this. Well, I have to say that today's cooking class was quite amazing, and I really enjoyed it. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Thank you.